Today, we're going to delve into the history of one of the most captivating and enigmatic figures of all time, Attila the Hun. Join us as we explore his life, his empire, and the mystery surrounding his final resting place. Attila the Hun was the leader of the ancient nomadic people, known as the Huns and ruler of the Hunnic Empire, which he established. His name means Little Father, and according to some historians, may not have been his birth name, but a term of affection and respect conferred on his accession. This name was synonymous with terror among his enemies and the general populace of the territories that his armies swept through. Attila's incursions into the regions of Germania drove the populations across the borders of the Western Roman Empire and contributed to its decline in the late 5th century CE. The influx of the Visigoths, in particular, and their later revolt against Rome, is considered a significant contributor to Rome's fall. The Visigoth victory over the Romans at the Battle of Adrianople in 378 CE was an event the Roman military never fully recovered from. Further, that victory encouraged the Huns to join the Visigoths in plundering Roman territories. The apparent weakness of Rome encouraged Attila, once he became leader of the Huns, to make and break treaties without fear of consequences and his wide-scale destruction of Roman cities and towns met with little or no resistance for the most part, making it clear that the Roman army was no longer the kind of invincible fighting force it once had been. Attila's ability to command a vast army of warriors was also in contrast to Roman generals of his time, who had difficulty keeping their non-Roman contingents under control. Attila was a brilliant horseman and military leader, possessed a commanding presence, and held his empire together through the strength of his individual personality. He not only made the Huns the most effective fighting force of the time, but he also built a vast empire from virtually nothing in less than ten years. At its height, this empire stretched from Central Asia across to modern-day France and down through the Danube Valley. After he died in 453 CE, his sons tried to hold his empire together but failed and it broke apart by 469 CE. Although in the present day, his mother's name is sometimes given as Hungizung Vladisov, her name is actually not known, and this name is considered a recent fabrication. His father's name was Munzuk, and his uncle, Rugula, was king of the Huns. As a young man, Attila, and his older brother Bleeder, were taught archery, how to ride and care for horses, and how to fight. They were also taught Latin and Gothic to enable them to do business with the Romans and Goths. Historians are divided on how much can be said with certainty regarding Attila's early years, and some claim that nothing is known of his early life, not even his birth name, and nothing should be inferred based on his later accomplishments. Whether Rugula had sons to succeed him is not known, and Munzuk seems to have died early in the boys' lives, so it appears that either Bleeder or Attila would be Rugula's heir and succeed him as king. Therefore, their education and instruction in warfare would have prepared them for the responsibilities of leadership. Both boys are thought to have been present at Hun war councils and negotiations from an early age. Even before Attila became king, the Huns were a formidable fighting force, although they would become more so later under his rule. They were expert horsemen whose steeds, according to ancient reports, would actually fight for them in battle with teeth and hooves. The brothers ruled jointly, each in control of their own regions and populace, and, as Lanning notes, frequently dealt with the Eastern Roman Empire, who formerly had paid the Huns as mercenaries to take care of the other tribes harassing Rome's boundaries, but now found they were paying to keep the Huns from invading. Attila and Bleda together brokered the Treaty of Margus with Rome in 439 CE. This treaty continued the precedent of Rome paying off the Huns in return for peace, which would be a more or less constant stipulation in Roman-Hun relations until Attila's death. An agreement between the Huns and the Romans had already been brokered in 435 CE by the Roman general Flavius Aetius, who had lived among the Huns as a hostage in his youth, spoke their language, and employed them to his advantage in his various power struggles in the empire. The Treaty of Margus expanded on Aetius' treaty, 
the Romans promised to return all Hun refugees who had fled into Roman territories, would not enter into pacts or treaties with enemies of the Huns, would establish fair trading rights and, of course, would make an annual payment of 700 pounds of gold directly to Attila and Bleda. For their part, the Huns promised not to attack Rome, not to enter into pacts or treaties with Rome's enemies, and to defend the Danube frontier and the provinces of the Roman Empire. The treaty concluded, the Romans were able to withdraw their troops from the Danube region and send them against the Vandals who were threatening Rome's provinces in Sicily and North Africa. The Huns turned their attention east after the Margus Treaty and warred against the Sassanid Empire, but were repelled and driven back toward the Great Hungarian Plain, which was their home base. With the Roman troops who once guarded the border now deployed to Sicily, the Huns saw an opportunity for easy plunder. They claimed the Romans had violated the Margus Treaty by not sending back all the Hun refugees in Roman territory and further, claimed that a Roman bishop had made a secret trip into Hun territory to desecrate Hun graves and steal valuable grave goods, and they wanted this bishop turned over to them. Theodosius sent his general Flavius Aspar to try to negotiate with Attila and Bleda, but it was no use. Attila showed Aspar recently disturbed graves, but there was no way of telling whose graves they were, who had disturbed them, or what may have been taken from them. With no proof of a crime, Aspar refused to turn the bishop over to the Huns and further, claimed he had no knowledge of Hun refugees hiding from Attila and Bleda on Roman soil. The Huns insisted. Aspar could not comply, and negotiations reached a stalemate. Aspar returned to Constantinople to report these developments to Theodosius, but does not seem to have felt there was any imminent threat of a Hun invasion. The refugees in question were Huns who had fled Attila's rule and who he wanted returned before they could stir up rebellion against him. As it turned out, there were still a number of refugees living in Roman territory, and the bishop Attila wanted most likely did rob the graves and would later betray the city of Margus to the Huns. It may have been better if Aspar had simply handed him and the refugees over in the first place. He did not do so, however, and considering the treaty broken, Attila mobilized for war. As Aspar headed back toward Constantinople in the summer of 441 CE, Attila and Bleda drove their armies through the border regions and sacked the cities of the province of Illyricum, which were very profitable Roman trade centers. They then further violated the Treaty of Margus by riding onto that city and destroying it. Theodosius II then declared the treaty broken and recalled his armies from the provinces to stop the Hun rampage. Attila and Bleda responded with a full-scale invasion, sacking and destroying Roman cities all the way to within 20 miles of the Roman capital of Constantinople. The city of Nasus, birthplace of Roman Emperor Constantine the Great, was razed and would not be rebuilt for a century afterwards. The Huns had learned a great deal about Roman siege warfare from their time serving in the Roman army and expertly put this knowledge to use, literally wiping whole cities, such as Nasus, off the map. Their offensive was all the more successful because it was completely unexpected. Theodosius II had been so confident that the Huns would keep the treaty that he refused to listen to any council that suggested otherwise. Theodosius II, Realizing he was defeated but unwilling to admit total defeat, asked for terms. The sum Rome now had to pay to keep the Huns from further destruction was more than tripled. After their Danube offensive, Attila and Bleda led their troops back home to the Great Hungarian Plain, where Bleda then vanishes from the historical record. Scholars have suggested that Bleda may have been killed on campaign, but, however he died, in 445 CE, Attila became the sole leader of the Huns and the most powerful military commander in Europe. Although Attila is almost always represented as a vicious warrior on horseback, slaughtering the multitudes, he was actually a more complex individual. Attila saw Rome as a feeble adversary and so, starting around 447 CE, he again invaded the region of Mosia, destroying over 70 cities taking survivors as slaves, and sending the loot back to his stronghold at the city of Buda. 
he was considered invincible, and in 450 CE, Valentinian's sister, Honoria, was seeking to escape an arranged marriage with a Roman senator and sent a message to Attila, along with her engagement ring, asking for his help. Although she may never have intended anything like marriage, Attila chose to interpret her message and ring as a betrothal and sent back his terms as one half of the Western Empire for her dowry. Valentinian, when he discovered what his sister had done, sent messengers to Attila telling him it was all a mistake and there was no proposal, no marriage and no dowry to be negotiated. Attila asserted that the marriage proposal was legitimate, that he had accepted and would claim his bride and mobilized his army to march on Rome. In 451 CE, he began his conquests with an army of around 200,000 men, although some set the number higher at half a million. They took Gallia Belgica province easily and moved on to ravage the land. The only time Attila had been turned back from a conquest was by the Sassanids, and his reputation for slaughter and invincibility preceded him as he moved through Gaul. The reputation of the Huns for brutality and indiscriminate slaughter was well known and sent the people of the land fleeing for their lives with whatever they could carry. The Hun army was one enormous cavalry unit that struck their adversaries quickly, neither asking for nor offering any mercy. It is little wonder that no general was especially eager to engage the Hun forces under Attila. Attila took Trier and Metz without opposition, massacred the citizens, and then rode on, destroying everything in his path. He was finally met in battle by the combined forces of the Romans under Flavius Aetius, who understood Hun strategy and tactics, and the Visigoths under Theodoric I on the Cataluanian plains. This engagement is known as the Battle of Cataluanian Fields and has been described as one of the bloodiest military conflicts in history and the first time Attila's forces were halted in an invasion of Europe. Although Attila had been stopped in his invasion, he had hardly been defeated. The Romans claimed the victory, however, and returned to their homes in the hope that Attila would now harass someone else. In 452 CE, he returned to invade Italy and claim the bride who had promised him her hand in marriage. The people of Italy, as the Gauls before them, were terrified of the Hun invasion but now, unlike the year before, Aetius did not have an army of sufficient force to stop Attila. Whole populations fled their cities and villages for safer regions. In flight from Attila's army, people took refuge on what solid ground they could find in the watery regions they felt Attila would bypass. They chose wisely in that Attila's forces avoided the lagoons and marched on toward more attractive grounds. For reasons no one knows, the Huns stopped at the Po River. A famine had been plaguing Italy for the better part of two years, and quite possibly Attila had simply run out of supplies. It has also been suggested that plague had broken out in Attila's army, which forced him to abandon his plans. Further, there is the suggestion that his men cautioned him against continuing on to sack Rome. The Gothic commander Alaric I had sacked Rome in 410 CE and died shortly afterwards. Superstition suggested Alaric's death was a direct result of his assault on such a prestigious city. It is also possible that some kind of peace was agreed to between Attila and Rome. Valentinian sent Pope Leo I with a delegation to seek terms from Attila, but the details of that meeting are unknown. All that is clear is that, following the meeting with Leo I and his delegates, Attila turned back and retreated to his stronghold in Hungary. Whether he remembered Honoria and the Dari is unknown, but he soon took a new young wife, in 453 CE, named Ildiko. As with Alexander the Great, alternative versions of Attila's death have been suggested. Versions include assassination by Ildiko, conspiracy and accidental death by alcohol poisoning. The entire army fell into intense grief over the loss of their leader. Attila's horsemen smeared their faces with blood and rode slowly, in a steady circle, around the tent which held his body. According to legend, a river was then diverted, Attila buried in the river's bed, and the waters then released to flow over it covering the spot. 
Those who had taken part in the funeral were killed so that the burial place might never be revealed. These, too, were honorable deaths, in that they were part of the funeral honors for the great warrior who had brought his followers so far and accomplished so much for them. Following his funeral, his empire was divided among his sons who fought with each other for the greatest share, squandered their resources, and allowed the kingdom to fall apart. By 469 CE, only 16 years after Attila's death, the empire was gone. Attila's memory, however, lives on as one of the greatest military leaders of all time. He has been depicted since his death as the epitome of a warrior king, and recent portrayals follow this traditional image. In March of 2014, it was reported that Attila's tomb had been discovered in Budapest, Hungary, which is thought to now comprise part of Attila's capital of Buda. The find generated a great deal of interest. Further analysis has revealed the claim to be a hoax. Although scholars have often been skeptical of the story of Attila being buried beneath a river, there is precedent for this. The Mesopotamian king Gilgamesh was said to have been buried beneath the Euphrates River, and this was long considered a myth. In April of 2003, a German team of archaeologists claimed to have discovered the tomb of Gilgamesh precisely where the ancient texts said it was. Archaeological excavations, conducted through modern technology involving magnetization in and around the old river of the Euphrates, revealed garden enclosures, specific buildings, and structures described in the Epic of Gilgamesh, including the Great King's Tomb. According to legend, Gilgamesh was buried at the bottom of the Euphrates when the waters parted upon his death. Much closer to Attila's time, Alaric I was said to have been buried beneath the waters of the Buzentu River in Italy after his death in 410 CE, the waters being diverted and then returned to their bed. According to the ancient sources regarding Attila's funeral, he was also buried beneath a river that was diverted and then returned to cover the tomb. It would seem imprudent, considering the precedent of the tomb of Gilgamesh story and the report of Alaric's burial, to dismiss the stories surrounding the last resting place of the great warrior Attila the Hun, and to claim he was buried elsewhere. Wherever his tomb is, and what treasures it contains, remains unknown. The worldwide interest in the story of his tomb's discovery, however, is a testimony to how great a hold on people's imaginations Attila still commands. He remains to this day one of the most interesting and engaging figures from ancient history, and his name is still associated with the concept of an unstoppable force. In conclusion, the story of Attila the Hun is one that continues to capture the imagination and fascination of people all over the world. From his rise to power as a young warrior, to his military campaigns and ultimate demise, Attila's legacy as one of history's greatest conquerors lives on. Even today, scholars continue to debate the legitimacy of his burial under a river, but with examples such as King Gilgamesh and Alaric I, it's entirely possible that Attila's tomb remains hidden beneath the flowing waters. Whatever the case may be, Attila's memory endures as a testament of his skill, tenacity, and expertise in warfare. Thank you for joining me on this journey. If you enjoyed this video, please remember to like and subscribe. Until next time, keep exploring the fascinating world of history.